This being Epiphany Sunday, Epiphany <coughs> means revealing, manifestation, and it refers to the way in which Jesus reveals or manifests God. And throughout this season of Epiphany, we'll see Jesus at a wedding in Cana of Galilee. We will see him baptized. We will see him calm a storm at sea and call disciples in a myriad of ways. Through the eyes of faith, we see what Jesus does and understand that God is being revealed through him. And so as we begin this morning on this Epiphany Sunday, we hear the story of the wise men going to see the baby. And it's kind of mysterious. If you stop and think about a star going across the heavens, how they were able to detect exactly where it stopped, where it shone its light. But one of the things about the season of Epiphany is the sense of mystery and wonder at what God does. There are a lot of things in life that if we're not careful, we can explain the wonder and the mystery and the very life right out of them. Take a kiss, for example. We all know what a kiss is, don't we? Or do we? Let me suggest to you that we may not know as much about a kiss as we think we do. If you were to get on the internet and Google descriptions or definitions of a kiss, you might be surprised to learn that according to a professor of physiology, a kiss is the juxtaposition, and I gotta be careful, this is a word that I don't use very often, it's really not in my lexicon, but I practice. A kiss is the juxtaposition of two obicularisaurus muscles. <laughs> obicularisaurus muscles, yeah. That's what a kiss is, the juxtaposition of two obicularisaurus muscles in the state of contraction. Or according to a professor of zoology, a kiss is the interchange of salivary bacteria. <laughs> Think about the next time you, well, no. <laughs> Professor of geometry might describe a kiss like this, that it's the shortest distance between two lips. Whereas a professor of economics might describe a kiss as that for which the demand is always greater than the supply. but of all of them, and there are a lot more that are in this list. Of all of them, my favorite is this one. And it comes from Professor of Physics. And he says, a kiss might be described as the contraction of the mouth <coughs> due to the expansion of the heart. I like that contraction of the mouth due to the expansion of the heart. But no matter how many different ways there are to define or to describe a kiss, when it comes right down to it, wouldn't you really rather experience one than try to define it or describe it? Whether it's in sermons or in Bible studies, or in Sunday school classes, over the years, I have tried really, really, really hard to help people understand the scriptures, uh, to answer their questions about their faith, their relationship with God, to clear up confusions. But as I was working on my sermon for this morning, I thought, I wondered, if in trying to help people understand the scriptures and their faith, etc., I wonder if I hadn't cheated them somewhat. I wondered if I hadn't cheated them out of the experience and opportunity of wrestling with God themselves, 
with their questions or their problems and discovering that God just doesn't reveal or impart knowledge to those persons who happen to be ordained. But the more I wondered about it, the more I began to fear that I had stunted a lot of people's growth over the year. You've heard the phrase, haven't you? Give me a fish and I'll eat today. Teach me how to fish and I'll eat forever. What I feared was that I spent a good deal of my ministry handing out fish over the years when what I really should have been doing was teaching people how to fish. And in the process, enabling them to experience for themselves the joy of discovering something about their relationship with God, maybe something that was just unique to them, or something that was part of the mystery of God that, as Paul says in his letter to the Ephesians, has been hidden for the ages but is now beginning to be revealed. Answers, they're important. But answers have a way of kind of closing off discussions. Answers kind of have a period at the end of them. Whereas questions keep the conversation going. They keep us on our knees or in an expectant mode inquiring of God, beseeching God, constantly bringing before God our concerns and our fears and our worries, as well as our questions. And so what I want to do in a few minutes this morning, which is kind of oxymoronic way of putting it, but what I want us to understand is that God is so much bigger than we can understand. I want us to understand. I want us to comprehend that God is bigger than we can understand and comprehend. I don't know about you, but I don't want a God that I can understand or comprehend so much as I want a God who takes my breath away. I don't want a God that I can explain so much as I want a God who makes me speechless. I don't want a God that just closes everything off. But I want a God that keeps me open to wonder and mystery and awe at the gift of life and of the riches, as Paul described in his letter to the Ephesians, the riches of the bounty of Christ. I want a God who, in the title of this morning's sermon, taken from Charles Wesley's great hymn, Love Divine, All Love's Excelling. I want a God who leaves me lost in wonder, love, and praise. And that is exactly the God that we have revealed in Jesus. So how do we do that? How do we become lost in wonder, love, and praise? I imagine there are probably as many ways as there are people and ways that God works in individual lives. But a good place to start is by praying. Praying that God would enlarge our capacity for wonder and mystery and awe. Praying that God would keep us open and receptive to the many and varied ways in which God comes into our lives, leading us to places we might not want to go, leading us through experiences that we would not choose to go through, but having gone through them, we look back and, and in the rearview mirrors of our lives, we see God was with us in ways that have forever changed us. The way to begin is to keep praying. Praying for God to keep us open and receptive to wonder and mystery and awe. But then the follow-up from that is to be ready to obey. 
to obey whatever God calls us to do, wherever God leads us, often experiencing God when and where we least expect. I believe that more than answers, what we need is obedience. What we need more than explanations is obedience. Because we can use our lack of understanding, we can use our lack of answers, we can, we can use the fact that we don't understand what God is calling us to do to disobey. When it comes to matters of forgiving, for example, when it comes to matters of following where God leads us, we put too much emphasis, I think, on the need to understand before we act. The truth is, when it comes to obedience, more often than not, all we need to really understand is that this is what God has called us to do. And then do it. We can have every question answered. We can have every confusion cleared up. We can have every aspect of whatever it is we're struggling with explained and clarified and still not be obedient. If it is important for us to understand why God is calling us to do this, if it is important for us to understand why God is leading us here or there, God will enable us to understand. But more important than having our questions answered or having things explained to us is our need to be obedient. A God I can understand, a God I can wrap my little tiny mind around, not much of a God, folks. Certainly not a God that commends my faith and my love and my obedience. More often, I think, than we might want to believe, faith is spelled O-B-E-D-I-E-N-C-E, -E -E, obedience. Regardless, of whether or not we understand or can explain why we're doing what God is calling us to do. The questions we have, if we have to have all of our questions answered before we can go forward in our relationship with God, we're not going to go very far. More than likely, we will stop moving. If we deal with life as a problem that has to be answered, or a problem that has to be solved, we reduce it to what we're able to understand. And again, what I can understand of God's ways, I need a God much bigger than that. If we approach life as a mystery, we are forever coming upon meanings that exceed our ability to understand and our definitions. Eugene Peterson, in one of his books entitled The Unnecessary Pastor, says, Scripture is not the answer book to all of our problems, but a doorway into the world of God's mystery. And one of the mysteries of this life is that God isn't interested in solving all of our problems in the way that we think they should be solved. Do you understand that? One of the mysteries of this life is that God isn't interested in solving all of our problems in the ways we think they should be solved. J.B. Phillips was uh, an English uh, clergyman and back in the 1950s, he wrote a little book entitled, Your God is Too Small. And what he said was, he said a lot of things in it, but this is one. 
The trouble with many people today is that they have not found a God big enough for modern needs. While their experience of life has grown in a score of directions, and their mental horizons have been expanded to the point of bewilderment by world events and by scientific discoveries, their ideas of, of God have remained largely static. Many men and women today are living often with inner dissatisfaction, without any faith in God at all. This is not because they're necessarily wicked or selfish or, as the old-fashioned would say, godless, but because they've not found with their adult minds a God big enough to account for life, big enough to fit in with the new scientific age, big enough to command their highest admiration and respect, and consequently, their obedience. If what Philip said was true better than 60 years ago, how much more so is it today? As we begin this season of Epiphany in which we begin to understand more clearly the ways that Jesus reveals who God is and how God is active and working not only in the world but in our own individual lives. And if the year 2013 and beyond will be anything like the years that have gone before, and there's no reason to think that it won't. With unseen tragedies, with things that we can't even begin to comprehend, we will need a God much bigger than a God we can understand. Given the kind of world in which we live, any God that we can comprehend, whose ways we can explain and make sense of, is not much of a God. And so my prayer for all of us is that as we enter this new year, we would pray that God keeps us open that God would expand our capacity to wonder and to stand in awe at who God is, what God has done, and what this incredible gift of life that we have received is possible of becoming. Praise be to God.